Good morning again, Victory Church. So good to be together with you on this Sunday, just a little bit before Christmas. And last week, I thought my wife did an excellent job proclaiming the good news of great joy for all the people. And that's what Jesus' birth is about, good news of great joy. But Jesus is also known as the comfort or the consolation of his people. And God wants to bring comfort into your life. And he knows we live in a society that is so stressed out, that is so full of anxiety, that we need the comfort that only God can give. And it's not just a societal thing either, but we all face challenges in life that disrupt our peace. And God is the God of all comfort. God wants to bring you comfort. God wants to bring you to a place of comfort. David recognized when he said in Psalm 23 about the Lord being our shepherd, not only does he provide all of our needs, but he leads us beside quiet waters. God wants to lead you into that place. And what I want to share today is about how we can be led by God into the place of his comfort. Because it needs to be something that God does, that we allow God to do in our lives. Now, we're a Pentecostal church, and we want to be spirit-led. And usually, I think we have, as a church, a bias toward action. And that is a very, very good thing. And as a result, usually when we think of being led by the Spirit, we think about what God wants us to do. And that's a good thing. What does Jesus want us to do for Him and for His glory? That is a good way to think. That is the way of thinking of a people in mission. And we want to maintain that. But we also want to include this other aspect of being led by the Spirit. Sometimes God just wants to lead you to a place where he can do something for you. God just, he wants to lead you so that you can be in a place where he can do something for you. That's the nature of our God. And today's passage really speaks to letting God do what he can do for us as individuals, as a church, as the people of God throughout the world. And so let's look at Luke chapter 2. And this is when Jesus is being presented in the temple. This is one of the foundational scriptures for our practice of dedicating children to God. But it's going to speak to us about our dedicating our own lives to God and receiving what he has for us, especially in terms of his comfort during a troubled time. Verse 22 of Luke 2. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons, which, by the way, was what the law allowed for a poor person to give when they couldn't afford the lamb. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation or exact same word, comfort of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in child, the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling 
and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against. Remember, we had a sermon series recently called Flip the Script, and that was a theme from Luke, and you see it right there as well. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against. In other words, Jesus is going to have some opposition, and he did to the point of death. In verse 35, and so, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. How old do you have to be to be considered very old in the Bible? We're going to find out. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Now, who's this passage about? Well, it's about Simeon and Anna in some way. It's certainly about Jesus. Jesus is the center of this passage. But we don't see Jesus actually doing anything. He's a baby. He is just letting happen what is going to happen to him through his parents. But also, there is another person Involved, who is very active in this, not just Simeon, not just Anna, not the parents of Jesus, not Jesus as a baby, but the Holy Spirit. How many of you heard the Spirit being mentioned multiple times by Luke in this passage? This is about what the Holy Spirit is doing. And this is an important concept for Luke. Luke has already introduced the Holy Spirit to us in chapter 1. Mary became pregnant by the work of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit's work is not done. And the reason that the work of the Spirit is so significant here for Luke is because according to the teaching of the rabbis in the day of Jesus, the Holy Spirit had not been moving on the earth for 400 years. The rabbis of Jesus' day recognized that the Holy Spirit had inspired the prophet Malachi, and that's we, why we have the book of Malachi as inspired scripture. But since the time of Malachi, the Holy Spirit had been quiet. Lisa pointed out last week that God had been silent. But here, Luke is not so much talking about God speaking as the Holy Spirit moving and working among people. And the Holy Spirit is at work. And he's been at work in this man named Simeon. It says in verse 26 that the Spirit had promised Simeon something very significant. He had promised Simeon that Simeon would not die until he saw the Messiah. And we don't know how many years that Simeon had been waiting on that promise to be fulfilled, but it was a promise spoken to him. Verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. And in the next verse, it says, moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts on the right day, the right place at the right time. So God had given him a promise. How many of you know that the Holy Spirit will give us promises? He will. He'll make the promises of Scripture real to you. God, by His Spirit, will reveal His promises to you. That's why we need the enlightenment of the Spirit, our spiritual eyes to be open, for God to give us that illumination that Paul prays for for the Ephesian church. We need the activity of the Holy Spirit to know the promises of God. But here's part of the problem for a lot of Christians today. We sometimes are very open to the revelation of God, but then we get a promise. Somebody speaks a prophetic word over us, perhaps, and God says something to us, 
through his word. We know God is going to do this. But then we must continue to remain in connection with the Holy Spirit because it might be that there is a particular time that you need to be, need to be at a particular place for that promise to be fulfilled. So Simeon not only had a revelation from the Spirit, but however many years later, he continued to be moved by the Spirit to be able to receive the promise that God had for him. God is constantly speaking to us, and if we'll be aware of it, he is constantly moving us to the place where his promise for our lives can be fulfilled. Uh, you know, I hate to think about how many promises we might miss out on because we've had the promise revealed, but we don't continue to be moved by the Spirit at the proper time. Think about it. God wants to move in us. And folks, let me just say this. While the Holy Spirit had not really been moving for about 400 years, while the Holy Spirit had not really been speaking for about 400 years, ever since this time, ever since the day of Pentecost that we read about in another of Luke's writings, the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit has been among us, and He's still speaking, and He's still revealing, and we should not take that for granted. We ought to be as excited about the voice of the Spirit and the moving of the Spirit right now as Simeon was on the day that he realized that the Spirit was really working in his time, that the time of the silence of God was over, the time of the seeming absence of the Spirit was over, and now God was moving in power. How about right now, folks? Today, Victory Church, right now, let's not take the work of the Holy Spirit for granted. In fact, I would suggest that we can learn from Simeon and Anna how to be more cooperative with the Holy Spirit in our time. What do you know about Simeon and Anna that made them the candidates to whom the Spirit revealed himself and revealed the promises of God and moved them to the place where they could receive what God had promised for them? What was it about them? Well, Simeon, we, we see two things. He was righteous and devout. He was righteous and devout. Th that is, he tried to live a right life with God, and he was devoted to God. Does that apply to us? You know, God has given us the spirit that the righteous demands of the law might be met in us. That's what Paul says in Romans. We are still called to live righteous lives. The spirit enables us to live righteous lives. And if we want to experience more of the leading of the Spirit, we want to hear the voice of God, we want to hear His promises, and then be ready to be moved to where we can receive the promises of God, then living a right life is important for that. I think sometimes our understanding of grace is such that we think that we don't have to do anything, and God just does it all. That's called Christian fatalism. That, that, we're, we're not fatalists. God works in us and through us. And in fact, when it comes to living a righteous life, Paul says in Philippians that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. We don't work for our salvation, but Christians, we are called to work out our salvation. And we should be devoted to God. We understand that the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. We're called to be devoted to God. We're called to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. I, I believe that the more righteous and devout we are, not in some legalistic sense, not from a perspective that, oh, we're so much holier than somebody else and we let our lives be full of pride because of our religious performance no but we understand that we are humbly working out our salvation before god we're devoted to him as best we can and in that humble attitude of a heart for god love for god and love for his people too on on top of that then we're in a position, you're going to hear from God, I promise. You're going to be blessed. And part of his desire is to get you to the place where you can receive the consolation of Israel, where you can receive the comfort and the joy that God has for you to experience. 
Now notice what it says here. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting. We just did a sermon series called The Waiting. What did we learn in that sermon series? I'm not going to you know, give you a test, but we learned this, that biblical waiting is not passive. Biblical waiting involves waiting on God with hope, waiting on God with eager expectation. Simeon, for however long, he was waiting after the promise was made that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. It was probably a long time of waiting, and I'm sure he wasn't trying to speed it up. <laughs> You know, because he probably wasn't eager to die. But he was waiting with eager expectation. Let me ask you, are you waiting on God with eager expectation? Are you waiting on God for the consolation that only comes from Him? There's a comfort that God has for you. There's a peace that God has for you. It will only come from God. And it won't come just because he made a promise to you 25 years ago. It'll come because right now, this moment, in this service, right now, you begin to turn your heart toward God with eager expectation. I'm believing God for a revival in America. We need it. Politics will not provide us the peace that we have. Folks, we could go on and on and on and on about corruption at the highest level on any side of any issue. And that's the reality in America right now. And if we're waiting on a political solution, we're going to be disappointed. But I'm believing for consolation. I, I, I'm not believing God for judgment on America. And I'm not equating Israel with America. What I'm saying is that the principles by which God works still work today. And I believe if the people of God in America and in any nation around the world, if the nations begin to wait on God with eager expectation, God's not going to let us down. He's not going to let us down. And one thing we see about Simeon is that he responded when the Spirit led him. Can you imagine if on that day that Jesus' parents brought him to the temple, right before they left to go back to Nazareth, as Luke tells us, can you imagine if Simeon had said, oh, I don't feel like going to the temple today. Can you imagine if he just hit the snooze on his alarm and just rolled over and went back to sleep and didn't go, wasn't led that day? then in spite of the truth of the promise, he would have missed out. People of God, let's be led by the Spirit to where He wants us to be. And where He wants you to be is somewhere good. It's good. It's peace. It's comfort. And then what about Anna? She was a prophet. There hadn't been any prophets for a long time. But Luke believes, no doubt, there was a prophet. Anna. She's a woman. She's a widow, which, you know, were some of the most left out of the culture of their day, some of the most desperate people of their day because they didn't have anybody to take care of them and they didn't have a social security network, and she's old. She might not just have been 84, as the NIV says. She might have been 105 or a little older because the Greek text says she had been a widow for 84 years. So maybe a widow of 84 years, in which case he meant her age, but he could have meant she had been a widow for 84 years. And if she got married when she was 14, 15, or 16, she would have been 100, 500, 600, 7. But she was waiting. She was actively waiting. And she wasn't being passive. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. And we know that this was for a long, long, long time. Waiting, 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 
waiting. We need to be willing to wait. But while we're waiting, are we passive? Is there eager expectation? How do we demonstrate that eager expectation? We worship God. We pray. We fast. We seek the face of the Lord. You know, whenever in Scripture you saw people recognizing that God wanted to do something, they began to pray and fast. We're going to do some of that in the coming new year. Pray and fast because God wants to do something at Victory Church. God wants to do something here. God has made me a lot of promises a long time ago. And I'm not old yet. I'm not 84. But I, I believe that we're moving into a season where we're going to see some promises bear fruit. And that means, you know, we don't just sit back and say, okay, God, you said you'd do it. Let's see. No, we begin to act like we're waiting, and we pray, and we fast, and we get ourselves into position for God to do what only God can do. That's what Anna was doing, actively waiting. Let's do something. And then God, her, God got her there at the right time. It doesn't say the Spirit moved her. The, the Spirit working in her is absolutely essential for her to be identified by Luke as a prophet. But it says at that very moment, she was right where Jesus had been brought to Simeon, brought to the temple, right at the very moment. God wants to get you right at the moment where you can receive what God has for you as well. And then Anna, she spoke to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. I mean, she begins to prophesy, basically. Simeon has his prophetic word, and Anna has her prophetic word. And there were other people who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. There were other people who were waiting for God to do something. And maybe their understanding of what God was going to do was a little bit off. Maybe they were a little bit too political in their understanding of what God was going to do. And that really was the case with Jesus' disciples. Even as you get into the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, and Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit, and they're wondering, you know, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? People had a misunderstanding of what Jesus was doing, yet they were there, they were expectant, and God gave them a word through Anna. She spoke to all who were there, which I believe we need to understand that the Spirit is still working, and what the Spirit is still doing is the same thing that He was doing back then. He is revealing the consolation of Israel to you, to me. How do I get that? Well, what is the greatest spiritual gift, according to Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, his first letter? Prophecy. Why? Because prophecy builds the church. And so in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, we see the one who prophesies speaks to people for what? They're strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. That's the work of the Spirit. He's still doing that. He, he, he's moving. And if the greatest gift that we could seek is prophecy because it builds the church, and prophecy is about strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Don't you think he still wants to do that today? That's part of the Spirit's work, is to bring you encouragement and comfort. Isn't that good? Now, I think it's important also that we recognize where this happened. Where did the Spirit lead Simeon? Where did God get Anna at just the right moment? It was the temple. The heart of the religious system of Jesus' day. Now, was the religious system of Jesus' day messed up? Yes, it was messed up. The leaders of that religious system are the ones who are going to fall, according to the prophecy that Simeon gave right there. The leaders of the religious system are the ones who are going to be threatened by Jesus about 30 years later. The leaders of that religious system were the ones who would make sure the Romans put Jesus to death. That religious system was messed up. But Jesus still called that place, what? My Father's house. Can I just say, the church is messed up, but it's still the bride of Christ. We are still the Father's house. We are still that temple 
being built with living stones, which is me and you. And because you and I are messed up, the temple gets messed up a little bit too. But we are still the body of Christ. And I believe a lot of what God wants to do is corporate just like this. The prophetic word that Simeon gives, the prophetic word that Anna gives to the people who are gathered there. I, I believe I'm giving that kind of prophetic word right now. And that happens as we gather together as the temple of God, now the living temple. And as we speak to one another, and as we receive God strengthening His encouragement and His comfort. Amen? Amen. Amen. Folks, I believe a lot of us are going to miss out on the promises of God because He's going to do it in the church service, and we've gotten tired of church services. Once a month is enough for most Americans today. Well, let me promise you something good and Pentecostal is going to happen on the Sunday you don't show up. <laughs> Isn't that the way it works? I, I love when people tell me, you know, Pastor Sarker missing Sunday. Oh, you missed a good one. I don't let them off the hook. <laughs> no, I do let people off the hook. But what is the purpose of these? If the Holy Spirit's job, the number one gift that he can give you is for exhortation, edification, and comfort. That's the King James Version of that First Corinthians passage. If that's his number one job, and the, the gifts of the Spirit are for what, according to Paul? For the common good. For the building up of the church. Think about it. That's the Spirit's job. That means if God wants to lead you to the place of comfort, I think He's going to lead you to the temple, to the church, to the body of Christ. That's where He's going to lead you. Can He lead you and do things for you on a personal, individual basis? Absolutely. But I believe God ministers His biggest and best promises in the context of who we are as the family of God, the temple. Think about it. You know, it, it's weird. You know, pastors are talking about this all over the country right now. Believe me, it's a national trend of attending church once a month. I don't know. It, it just happens. But you look at parts of the world where the church is persecuted, and they risk their lives to meet together every week. Go figure. One of the things I knew, I knew that I was called by God early in my conversion to the Lord, really. I got prayed for in September of 1983. God used him as he called him to be used. I knew I had a call. I tried going to the college campus group every week. I was growing. Went to Campus Crusade for Christ National Christmas Conference, KC 83, Kansas City 83. Billy Graham spoke. Man, I knew God was calling me. I knew it. But when I got back to my college campus, January 1984, I knew. I don't know how I knew. Nobody told me this. I knew. I need to go to church. And I didn't have a car, so I had to find one within walking distance. And I told God this. I said, God... I want to go where they're going to teach me the Bible, but I don't want anything to do with that speaking in tongues stuff. <laughs> he led me to First Baptist Church, Danville, Kentucky. But I'll tell you what, the Spirit was moving in that. By the way, a few months later, I was speaking in tongues, so that's another story. But Brother Albert Giesper, who passed away this past year, he said that when he saw me standing in the Sunday school classroom door that he knew God had a call on my life and, and I believe I, I really do believe this that I was so in two worlds at that time if he hadn't taken me under his wing to the degree that he did that I probably wouldn't be standing here right now God led me to the church yeah I was called 
but he led me to the church. And I, I believe that God is going to lead us to the church for the greatest comfort that he can give us. And of course, here, here's the truth, and I think sometimes this truth makes us think that the other truth is unimportant, and that is the Holy Spirit ultimately leads us to Jesus. It's not all about the temple. It's not even all about the church. Ultimately, it's all about Jesus. Now, we are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the representatives of Jesus. We are the temple of the Spirit of Christ. But Jesus is the focus. Jesus is the center of it all. Amen? So Simeon and Anna were not just led to the temple and led to the right place at the right moment on the right day, but they were led to Jesus. What was Simeon waiting for? I've referred to it a few times. The consolation, the comfort of Israel. Jesus is the message of great joy. But the message of Jesus is also good news of comfort. For Israel, you better believe it. But not just Israel. For all nations. For all nations. What does Simeon say? Hey, comfort for all nations. See, the Holy Spirit is the comforter. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit is the agent of the Trinity on earth today. Paul often refers to him as the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ. And he is the comforter. When Jesus was preparing to leave this earth, he said, I'm going to send you another comforter. Another meaning one like me. Now, I think in recent years we have gotten away from calling the Holy Spirit the comforter. Because the Greek word for comfort can mean a lot of things. The Greek word for comforter can mean a lot of things. And it is true. It is parakletos, the one who is called alongside. And so we like to think of Jesus as our counselor, our advocate. How many of you have heard it being taught that the Holy Spirit is like our lawyer? I, I love all those things, and they're all true. They're all contained in that word, but I think maybe we get away from comfort because that's too soft a word. It's too soft of an idea, and we don't realize the degree to which God just wants to bring consolation. He wants to console us. Amen? Maybe we could just start calling him the comforter again. Yeah, advocate, lawyer. Good things, but maybe we like that and we are drawn to that because it seems more active and, you know, we're such a litigious society. We're all about, you know, you know taking things to the courts and that sort of thing. And, and there's some truth in that, but he's our comforter. Comforter. Can we just let him do that? Just be there with us? He's just alongside of us. You, you don't even have to see him arguing your case. He's just with you. And that's the basic meaning of the word. Simeon knew that this was comfort God was bringing to Israel. Acts 28, 20. Paul says this about his own ministry. For this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. Folks, this is the hope of Israel. But it was not just for Israel, was it? Going back to Luke 2, verses 30 and 31 and 32, this is what Simeon says. You can let me go now, Lord, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Salvation. My eyes have seen your salvation, God. That's enough for me. That's enough. Elizabeth, I'm coming for you. He can go home now. It was enough just to see Jesus. You got to be old to know that reference about Elizabeth.
here's the crazy thing about this. Up to this point, Jesus had done absolutely nothing for Simeon. And yet he says, it's enough. Jesus at this point was sweet baby Jesus. Or as Ricky Bobby says, Lord baby Jesus. Reference to Talladega Nights. You don't have to be quite as old to know that one. Now I just reviewed that little clip from the Ricky Bobby's prayer last night, just like, oh, boy, how did he refer to Jesus? Lord, baby Jesus. Finally, his wife is just like, he's grown up now, you know? <laughs> now, Catholics are very accustomed to the image of Jesus as a little baby. They are. You, you probably go to a Catholic church and find an image of Jesus as a little baby almost immediately, right? Am I right? And we Protestants are very uncomfortable with that for a couple of reasons. It's because usually when you see little baby Jesus, it's okay in a manger scene at Christmas, but the rest of the year, put that baby Jesus away. Aren't we like that? Protestants, yes, we're like that. So we are very uncomfortable with the image of Mary holding Jesus because we think, oh, that puts too much emphasis on Mary. Now, I'm not going to consider that or talk about that but that's why we're uncomfortable with that and also we're like ricky bobby's wife he's grown up he grew up he died on the cross he was raised from the dead he is seated at the right hand of the father making intercession for us he's the conquering warrior that's how i want to see jesus i think ricky bobby's son wanted to see jesus as a ninja warrior or something like that you know that's how we want to see Jesus. But think about this for Simeon. See, baby Jesus is enough. It was just enough. You, you, what does that teach us? It teaches us this. It's not really always what God does for us that we most need. It's just that God is here with us. His presence is his salvation. Now, God does a lot of stuff for us. We believe in that. But probably what we need more than anything else is just, we just need God. We just need his presence. Think about the comfort that you receive. When do you need comfort? Usually about something that's already happened. And it, it's happened. That person hurt you. That person betrayed you. Your heart is broken. That situation's not going to be fixed. That person died and is in heaven. They're not coming back. So what kind of comfort or consolation do we need? We just need God's presence. Are you there? Husbands, haven't you had to learn that about your wives when they tell you their problems and you immediately come up with a solution? Any other husband like that besides me? And they don't want your solution, they just want you? Is that just me? Well, you got me, but here's what you need to do. Sometimes we just need God. And, and that's not a matter of being male or female. Guys, sometimes we just need God. We just need His presence. Yeah, he, he's not going to fix that. He, he's not going to somehow undo what has already happened to you. But He will comfort you in it. Yeah, and I could go on to a lot of other things that He's going to do in your life and how He's going to take that and turn it around for good all those things, but I think sometimes we want to go on to those things before we just let God be with us. So Simeon, hey, that's enough. I'm ready to go. You haven't done anything else. Jesus hasn't shed his blood. He hasn't preached a sermon. hasn't done a miracle. Nothing. That's enough. God, I've seen your presence 
here on this earth. I have experienced it. Where do you need his comfort right now? Just Jesus being with you. In what situation? What grief? What pain? Jesus is here. See, his Holy Spirit is here. His primary gift involves strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Receive that right now. Just close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your presence. Thank you for your touch on us right now. You are here. You've led us to this place today. And Lord, I, I can just imagine there's somebody here who thinks, I almost stayed home today. I almost let this disruption keep me home. But Lord, you brought them here today to receive a word of exhortation, edification, comfort. Show your presence. Show your presence right now. Lord, we long for the days of your power and of your miracles. We want to see you walking on water, oh God. But Lord, just for today, for today, it's enough that you're here. You're right here. We fear no evil, for you are with us. All anxiety, all worry gone. Lord, we pray for the hurt and pain of loss, of betrayal, of abuse of all kinds. Bring your presence, O oh God. Bring your presence, O oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak the light of Christ into every dark place in your heart and soul right now. Right now, in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you that the light of your presence fills our darkness right now. Hallelujah. 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 Worthy are you, Lord Jesus. Worthy are you, Lord Jesus. You are awesome. You are amazing. You did give up your place and glory and come to this world as a little baby. And you lived a perfect life and died a death that you didn't deserve. But you were raised from the dead and you are Lord. You are Lord. And you sent your spirit to be among us right now. heads bowed and eyes closed let me just remind you that the spirit led Simeon and Anna to the place where they could receive what they needed to receive and if you're here today without ever having made a conscious decision to surrender your life to God I can tell you this the spirit brought you here today because Jesus wants to come in he wants to come into your life and what we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer to receive Christ and if you would say, I want to be included in that prayer. You're not going to be singled out. You're not going to be called forward. But if you would say, I want to be included in that prayer. I want to surrender my life to Christ today. Then when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Or if you at one time surrendered your life to Christ, but you wandered from God, and now the Spirit has led you back here today. And you know it's time to rededicate your life to God, to give your life back to God, then when I say three, you also raise your hand. So whether for the first time or whether you're coming back to Christ, when I say three, be bold. Don't worry about anybody beside you. If they raise their hand or not, or if they see you raise your hand, this is you making a conscious decision to say yes to the offer of life that God is making to you right now. He's brought you here. You followed him here. So now, following that next step. When I say three, raise your hand. One, two, three. 
shoot your hand up. Say, that's me. I'm saying yes to Jesus today. Others? Amen. Let's pray this prayer out loud. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me and you sent your son to die on the cross for my sin. Jesus died. He was raised from the dead. And he is Lord. Forgive me of all my sins and be the Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for eternal life. I'm yours, God. In Jesus' name, amen.